Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I'm going to start chapter 18 which is biodiversity. I just want to say here at the beginning that um, for this chapter I am not going to cover certain aspects of the chapter. So the aspects like classification, threats to biodiversity, how we conserve biodiversity are aspects I will not cover at all. So I'm going to cover just the first half of the chapter where it talks about calculating Simpson's index of diversity, how to do sampling and all of those. So I hope that you still find them helpful. If you are preparing for the upcoming exams, which will be happening on the 5th of May for paper four, please by all means um, check the solutions to past papers um, playlist so that you're able to access some videos where I have solved questions um, from paper four there in preparation for your exams. So we're just going to run through some definitions very quickly just so that you can get into the spirit of things but also know that some of these definitions we have already discussed in chapter 17 so in a way chapter 18 and chapter 17 are linked to each other so first things first is biodiversity and when students define biodiversity they tend to just say biodiversity is the degree of variation of life forms in an ecosystem which is correct but you also need to go a little bit further and refer to the number of habitats and niches the number of species and the genetic diversity within those species in the last chapter we discussed species where we said they are similar morphologically biochemically and physiologically and they're able to reproduce to, to give um, fertile offspring so they're able to breed together to give fertile offspring we can also define an ecosystem as a community of organisms that interact with the environment and it includes the environment in which they live. Um, also, we have a habitat and niches and a habitat is basically where the place a species live within an ecosystem, while a niche refers to the role of an organism in the ecosystem. So um, the levels of biodiversity that you might encounter and the way you would encounter this in questions, for example, might be you'd be asked, um, state how this very diverse place that has been described in the question contributes to biodiversity. And what you need to do here is to then mention that it contributes by having various ecosystems, by having various habitats, by having num a high number of different species, and by having a high genetic variation within each species. And that would be the levels of biodiversity. So species diversity and genetic diversity is something else that we measure in biology. And what species diversity simply measures is the number of is the number of species that you would find in a particular area. And in a way, we also call that species richness. So the more species there are in an area or in a community, then you also find that the more evenly distributed the species tend to be. You also find that areas that have high species diversity tend to be more stable than the areas that have low species diversity. And the result of this is because when you have high species diversity, then you simply have high allele diversity, which is what links us to genetic diversity. So you have a high genetic diversity and the higher the genetic diversity, the higher the chances of this system becoming resilient, um, even when there is something that's um, dangerous or that attacks them. So if we were to use the rabbit example in um, what's it, in chapter 17 as our as our example here, if we think about the fact that we spoke about only brown and white rabbits, but what if we had rabbits that were shades in between? That definitely increases the species um, richness of the of the area and then might result in the rabbit population surviving better if they are being um, hunted by predators. So that is just one way of thinking about it. It's not the perfect example, but I hope it sort of helps you understand what is being communicated. So how do we assess species diversity? Um, usually biologists would do what is called a timed field search within a specified um, study area and sometimes they use what is called a dichotomous key to identify organisms uh, but usually that can be very very exhausting especially if the area is large and the species you're measuring are really tiny so imagine if I went into the field and I said I wanted to measure a particular kind of insect and so I'm standing there with a dichotomous key and I'm trying to measure this insect over a specified area it is just too much much work. So usually what um, scientists would do is they take samples from the area of interest and use those samples to estimate the total number of species in the area. So if, for example, you have a large field, you would then take samples from a specific section of the field, which might be sectioned off and measured in meters or square meters, depending on what you're doing. And then you can decide on 
you can use that as an estimate if you know the largest size of the field or the, the full size of the field rather. So this is what we call sampling. Okay, We just take samples from a specified area um, or a section of the area we're trying to measure and we use those samples to estimate what might be happening all over the area. Sampling can be random or it can be systematic. Random sampling is usually used to assess species diversity, especially if the area looks uniform, um, or it is also used if there is no clear pattern to how the species might be distributed within the area. So this is what random sampling looks like. Um, as you can see, I'm sure you've probably seen this before. Sometimes when I go to the park for a walk, I usually see students doing their biology projects holding one of these. This is called a quadrat. Okay, and as you can see, it's a big square that's made up, made up of many little squares um, in between, so over there. And what you do with a quadrat is simply you can use it um, to randomly assess or to randomly estimate how much of a particular species exists in a particular area. So you can mark off the area by placing the quadrat on it, and obviously you know the size of the quadrat, so that inevitably tells you the size of the area that you've measured. You also take samples randomly within the quadrat in order to ensure good representation, and then you can use that to calculate the species density. Species frequency is basically referring to the possibility of finding a particular species within a quadrat. So if you want to calculate this, you have to record the number of squares in which the species is present, divide that by the total number of quadrats that you have, multiply by 100 and you'd get a percentage value. Species density, on the other hand, is measuring how many individuals of a species there are per unit area. So in this case, you count the number of individuals and you divide by the total area of your quadrats. And that is how we would calculate these two. But I have an example on the next slides that would help you understand better. Okay, so this is an example from the textbook I'm using. It's, all, it's not a worked example. It's actually a question that was posted there for students to work through. But I'm just going to show you how all of these things um, work. So if we look here, it says um, a survey gave the following results for a species of the red sea anemon on a rocky shore in New Zealand using a quadrat with an area of 0 0.25 square meters. And here, calculate the species frequency. So if you want to calculate species frequency, what you need to do is to count the number of um, occurrence of that species. In other words, within these 10 quadrats, how many times does the species occur? So you're not calculating the actual value, you're just calculating the frequency at which it occurs. So here's one, that's two, there's three, this is four, and this is five. And so that tells you that it occurs five times, and you divide that by the total number of quadrats, which is 10, and you multiply by 100, and already you know that that is going to give you 50%. So the frequency is always represented as a percentage. All right, then um, we asked to also calculate the species density um, from the results of this survey. When it comes to the species density now, you're calculating the number of organisms or the number of the Red Sea anemone that you see in each quadrat. So over here we have three plus one, plus five, I'm just adding the values that are circled, plus two, plus one. And if we look at this, I think when you add all of this up, so that's four plus five, nine plus two, 11 plus one, that's 12. So we know that we found 12 of this organism in our 10 quadrats. And it says a quadrat has an area of 0 0.25 square meters. So that means for 10 quadrats, we would say 0 0.25 square meters times 10, and that would give us 2.5. I hope you're following, because this is the area basically for one quadrat. So it says a quadrat, but we have 10 different ones. And so to then get the species density, we just have to say 12 divided by 2.5 square meters. And I believe, let me just check with a calculator, that should give us a value of... Um, that should give us a value of 4.8. So our species density in that case is 4.8. All right. Um, and obviously, why, when it might be more appropriate to use species frequency than density, um, that would then be because you are 
it will be when you're trying to sort of predict the likelihood of finding a particular species in a certain area. So I think that would be an appropriate response there. Okay, so now we've spoken about how you can use quadrats to sample, but something that you need to take into consideration is that if you're dealing with mobile animals, so for example, if we were sampling lions, um, there's no way we can fit a quadrat around a lion for starters, but also there's also the issue of the fact that lions move around. And so we can't use quadrat sampling for animals that are mobile, um, especially the, those that are highly mobile, right? You can use it for maybe things like plants, for example, uh, but not necessarily for animals. And so for animals, what we often use is what is called mark release recapture. And mark release recapture is a technique where um, you catch many individuals of that species as possible and you mark them harmlessly. So you need to make sure that the mark is very evident, but it is also um, it's harmless to the, to the organism. And when we say it's harmless, it doesn't mean that oh, you have to use maybe, for example, some organic dye that doesn't um, kill the animal, but also it has to be something that doesn't make it easily seen by predators. Um, so that's when we say harmless marking. And once you've done that, you would count all the marked individuals and return them to their habitat to mix with the rest of the population. After some time, you go back again, you catch a large sample, and in that large sample, you then count the number of marked and unmarked animals. So think about it this way. We go, for example, to a nature reserve, and we want to estimate the number of lions that are there. And so we capture maybe as many lions as we possibly can within a set period of time. So say we capture 10 lions the first time and we mark these lions maybe by putting a brace around their necks and we then release them back into the natural environment to go and mix with other lions. When we go back to that environment and we want to recapture, there's a chance that we would not capture the 10 animals that we captured the first time. So we will have a mix of animals that are not marked as well as animals that are marked and you then use these values to calculate what um, the population should be and i'm going to show you an example that was done in the textbook so here we go um, this is an example brown plant hoppers a serious insect pest of rice and some students used sweep nets to catch a large sample in the field of rice each animal was marked with a very small spot of non-toxic waterproof paint and then they were released across the field and the next day a second sample was caught. So the number caught in the first sample was 249, uh, 247, sorry. And in the second sample, they caught 259. But now in the second sample, the number of the flies or the plant hoppers that were actually marked were 16. And so in order to estimate the population of plant hoppers in the rice field, you take the number caught in the first sample multiplied by the number caught in the second sample, divided by the number of marked animals in the second sample. And that would give you your population, in which case, in this case, it is 3,998. So those are random sampling techniques. Um, so the two examples are that you can use um, a quadrat or you can use the mark release recapture method. In systemic sampling, um, it's a very different story. And you use systemic sampling in an environment where conditions are likely to change. And so in this point, what you do is you select a starting point and you measure a tape in a straight line. So you can see over here, um, if you look at this image that I got from the textbook, um, you can see over here that you use, um, what's it called? You have a measuring line over there. And then you simply sample the organisms along the line. And what this does, this is called a line transect. And what it does is that it gives you qualitative data because it focuses mostly on the identity of the organisms at set points. So for example, if you say that at every 0.1 meters along this line, I'm going to check what species are there. So in this case, you can say maybe that's um, lovely shrub grass, and then you call that again, lovely shrub grass. This might be a different species that you find at this different point, and here is something entirely different. So you focus more on identity rather than um, the amount or the numbers in which they occur. Then you have the belt transect. So the line transect and the belt transect are very alike. In the belt transect, what you typically do is that you set up a line transect as per usual, 
but then you use a quadrat, um, you add a quadrat to it to sort of get the number of species within the quadrat, and you represent whatever you find as a bar chart or a kite diagram. And I'm just going to show you a kite diagram on the last slide, and that would be the last point for this video. So this is what it would typically look like. So look here, this is the distance um, on the line transect that was set up, and then the quadrat is put there, and you can see um, how many of these um, species you can find. So for example, a kelp, there are only three, and those three occur at the distance zero, so you simply put that there, so that's three. And then over here, you have them occurring, there's five at the beginning, four, five, 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 and you can see it starts off wide and then it becomes a little bit slimmer. I have never seen CIE ask questions about this, but I always tell students, please don't prepare on the basis of the past. I mean, the past is good to prepare you, but also prepare for anything because they might ask you, for example, to interpret a graph like this. And I imagine many students would feel very lost. So again, just look at the values and notice the fact that um, for the values that are bigger, the triangle or the shape that's being drawn sort of widens. So over here, it starts off with a 5, it becomes a 4 at 20 meters. So there we go, you can see at 20 meters, so there's a dip there. And then at 40 meters, it's a 5 again, and so it widens back. Um, and you can see there, at 100, it's also 5. And at the top, it's usually just drawn like a kite. So that is just one way of looking at it. And again, I've never seen questions like this. But be prepared for anything because you never know. That is the end of this video. In the next video, I will show you how to calculate Simpson's index of diversity. Um, so I hope that you find that really helpful. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.